Tonight, the pilot accused of killing two campers moved to Melbourne as police target a new search zone. New cricket shocks as Tim Payne walks and Australia appoints its new Ashes leaders. A vaccine booster push as the world faces a worrying COVID variant. Australian troops sent in to restore peace as the Solomon Islands burn. China's spy ship off our coast sparks a fresh defence warning. And Melbourne retail bouncing back as Black Friday shoppers spend a million dollars a minute. Live from Melbourne, 7 News with Peter Mitchell starts now. Good evening. The Jetstar captain accused of killing two Highland campers is now behind bars in Melbourne as police prepare to launch a new search for the missing pair. The 55-year-old pilot's wife watched online as he faced the murder charges in court for the first time. A 20-month mystery entering its next phase. Gregory Lynn leaves Sale Police Station in a prison van bound for Melbourne after facing court via video link charged with two counts of murder. He sat silently with his hands crossed throughout the brief filing hearing before a Sale magistrate. His wife watched the proceedings online. This has been an exhaustive and complex criminal investigation. The 55-year-old airline pilot has been remanded in custody to appear in court on May 31st next year. After four days of questioning, the charges came through last night. The male that was arrested on the 22nd of November has been charged with the murders of Russell Hill and Carol Clay. 7 News understands information gleaned from hours of interviews with Greg Lynn has pointed police to an area near Dargo, about 70 kilometres from the site where the two campers went missing 20 months ago. Police are hopeful that we will be able to locate the deceased and provide closure, ultimate closure, to the families. Wet weather forecast for this weekend has paused the search for now, but it is expected to ramp up early next week. Detectives will spend the coming days assembling a search squad and a plan on how to tackle this difficult terrain. We are hopeful that this arrest brings us a step closer to providing the answers the families have been desperately seeking and richly deserve. This afternoon, Greg Lynn started his three-hour journey from his Sale police cell to the Melbourne Assessment Prison on Spencer Street. In a statement, his family says they're completely traumatised by these tragic events. They want to restore some balance in their lives and acknowledge the suffering of the Clay and Hill families. We're learning more about the pilot's past. A father of two and an experienced bushwalker, he did the Kokoda Trail by himself. Lynn's former wife, Lisa, died suddenly in 1999 an ex-colleague revealing she died with pills and vodka in her system. And in 2002, he moved to the Middle East as a captain for Qatar Airways. He returned to Australia to work for Jetstar in 2007. A serving Jetstar check captain, sources say Lynn had been assessing other pilots right up until his weekend trip to the Gippsland bush. And Cassie Zervos joins us now. Cassie, Greg Lynn is spending his first night in prison. Well, Mitch Lynn arrived here two and a half hours ago and as we go to air, he is still being processed. He didn't apply for bail, but that is to be expected. Any bail application on a murder charge must be heard in the Supreme Court. At this stage, there is still no indication on how he intends to plea. He was represented in court today by the same lawyer who looked after Porsche driver Richard Pusey. Mitch. Cassie Zervos at the assessment prison. Thank you. Pat Cummins was today handed one of the country's greatest sporting honours, named as Australia's new Test cricket captain. The announcement coming just hours after Tim Payne revealed he was standing down from all cricket indefinitely. It wasn't the traditional way to announce Australia's new captain and vice-captain. It came via Zoom video, and once the glitches were sorted, a clear view of a man universally praised as the natural next leader. I'm not going to be anyone different. I'm going to be myself, and, uh, yeah, hopefully that's enough. The 47th Test captain and first-time dad. Wife Becky's reaction? She was, uh, yeah, impressed for about two minutes and then <laughs> back to keeping our baby alive. Mum and Dad were, were super excited. Um, yeah, there was a few tears. 
Cummins' deputy, former skipper Steve Smith, the only ones interviewed for the roles. An extraordinary rebound from the 2018 Sandpaper Gate scandal and a decision condemned by Shane Warne. There'll be some, some negativity from some people around it. I understand that and I get that. Um, but for me, I, I know that I've, I've grown a great deal. A monumental day for so many reasons. Cummins ranked the world's number one test bowler, the first fast bowling skipper since Ray Lindwall in 56. Lindwall bowls to Peter Richardson. 65 years. It's a decade since he first put on the baggy green. South Africa, now Australia's highest paid, five million a year, including IPL. University educated, passionate about the environment and indigenous issues. At 28, not afraid to speak his mind, especially on the captaincy. Yeah, a lot of the pressure and the responsibility of being perfect is, is unreasonable. I think it's too much to ask of anyone. Um, Cummins today defending the skipper he replaced, Tim Payne, after his manager confirmed today he was leaving for an indefinite mental health break. We're extremely concerned for his and Bonnie's well-being. Anyone from the outside probably thought that everything was under control and everything was going really well, but obviously what's happened has taken its toll and he needs some time away. Cummins revealing they've been in regular contact since last week's sexting scandal. You really feel for Tim and his family. Having been through some tough times myself, I, I urge him to you know, take care of himself. Payne's wife, Bonnie, tweeting her thanks today. Whilst from the outside public look at our cricketers as superheroes, um, on the inside, they're human beings. Payne now all but ruled out of the ashes, possibly pulling stumps on his international career altogether. Chris Reason, 7 News. A fifth Andrews government MP is quitting at the next election. Long-time member for Lara, John Erin, has announced he'll be retiring in 2022 after almost 20 years in politics. The former cabinet minister has been battling Parkinson's disease for the past two years. Mr Erin kick-started Visit Victoria and promoted women in sports. A new COVID strain in South Africa has health authorities on alert, with the UK and Israel taking immediate action to suspend flights. Our government says there's no immediate concern here, as it leads a new push for booster vaccines. At London Heathrow Airport, they're changing travel rules this weekend for people inbound from South Africa. A new variant's been discovered there, B11529. It doesn't have a name yet, but it does have the immediate attention of the World Health Organisation, releasing this video on Twitter. It will take a few weeks for us to understand what impact this variant has. The Australian government says there's no immediate concern. At this point in time, um, there's uh, very little... Uh, traffic uh, directly between South Africa and Australia. But the UK has banned all flights from six African countries, including South Africa, Namibia and Zimbabwe. Our scientists uh, are, are deeply concerned uh, about this variant. The concern, it might be more transmissible than Delta and vaccines might not be as effective. I don't think it's very legitimate at the moment. It's way too early to say whether it's going to be any more transmissible than the Delta variant. We don't know very much about this yet. What we do know is that this variant has a large number of mutations. The World Health Organisation says mutations occur when the virus circulates freely. One of the challenges for South Africa is that the vaccination rate, and I just reviewed it this morning, I think is just over 28% of whole of population. Australia is more than two and a half times that, an inequality highlighted by a letter from our Prime Minister being sent to all Australian homes, promoting 151 million doses for boosters, freely available, taken from six months after your second dose. COVID hospital patient numbers in Victoria are stable, but cases, more than 1,300, are up three days in a row, and seven people with COVID have died. If the new variant emerges as a threat, mRNA vaccines like Pfizer and Moderna can provide protection. Apparently, it's relatively simple to tweak them once you know the genome of the new variant, which we do already. This drive through test site in Albert Park is quite busy this evening, despite it being a Friday, a solid stream of cars coming through. And that continues a really strong st uh, trend of testing this week. 73,000 completed yesterday. That's about 10,000 up on the seven day average. The health department says most test results are coming back the next day. And despite some rumors this morning, the health department has also confirmed there is no shortage of PCR test equipment. Pete? Blake Johnson at Albert Park, thank you. 
Brett Sutton has faced a grilling over the deaths of 50 elderly residents at St Basil's during Victoria's second wave. He admitted his decision to stand down the entire workforce meant they didn't get proper care and that it contributed to the fatalities. The Chief Health Officer endorsed an order to remove the entire workforce from St Basil's aged care home while the facility was in the grips of a COVID outbreak. And today he told an inquest into the deaths of 50 residents. He stands by the decision that resulted in the Commonwealth sending in inexperienced agency staff. In hindsight, the inadequate care of residents contributed to the fatality rate. I think it may have for some of the residents. Another harrowing day for family members seeking answers. Well, it was important for me to hear it with my own two ears and to see him in court. Professor Brett Sutton gave evidence he wasn't aware there were any problems securing appropriate replacements when he signed the order, but didn't check. I didn't have some kind of strong and overarching assurance it was hunky-dory, but equally you didn't ask. No, I didn't ask. He didn't have all the evidence. He made a decision without all the evidence. The Chief Health Officer offered his heartfelt sorrow to families. Professor Sutton pointed the finger at the Chairman of St Basil's for refusing to comply with an earlier direction to quarantine his staff. He says leaving the exposed workforce in the facility could have resulted in a further spread of infection and deaths. The inquest heard COVID clusters in aged care are now managed differently as more than 40 Victorian facilities currently grab breaks. Jade Vincent, 7 News. Australian soldiers have been deployed to the Solomon Islands to tame violent protests de destroying the city of Honiara. Angry protesters are setting fire to local businesses and homes as a civil crisis deepens. <laughs> At their base in Townsville, packing for a mission to restore peace and to be prepared for anything. It's a volatile situation. Uh, our teams obviously are very well trained and well equipped for the task. Around 40 Defence Force personnel ordered to the Solomon Islands capital, hit by days of protests, <laughs> rioting, looting and burning. The soldiers supporting more than 70 Australian Federal Police officers in their mission helping local police regain control. The first flight of AFP officers arriving there overnight, personnel already on the streets of Honiara that have been left smouldering by the days of destruction, locals shaken by the extent of the damage. This is really heartbreaking. The protesters demanding Solomon Islands Prime Minister Sogavare resign over his formalising ties with China, with many demonstrators from a part of the country that is pro-Taiwan. Chinese-owned businesses were targeted. China demanded protection for its citizens. We are gravely concerned, he says, over the attacks. Part of the Parliament House compound was set on fire and a police station burned down. This timber yard among those businesses set ablaze. <laughs> Prime Minister Sogavari today blamed unnamed foreign countries for stoking the unrest, refusing to resign. Australia insisting it won't be intervening in their political crisis. The mission to restore calm will last weeks. Paul Kadak, 7 News. Australia's Defence Minister has warned conflict with China could be catastrophic and perilous amid rising tension in the Pacific. Peter Dutton fired off the warning after a Chinese spy ship spent weeks on the edge of our maritime border. A Defence Minister more comfortable on the offence... There's no point uh, in mincing words, and I'm not widely known for doing that. ..not mincing his words on China... Every major city in Australia, including Hobart, is within range of China's missiles. Insisting... We are anxious to live at peace with our neighbours. But suggesting China's strategic designs are growing. Labor says he's right to be frank about the risks, but... We are concerned that he's using war rhetoric for electrical purposes. Peter Dutton says... Acquiescence or appeasement is a tactic that ends in a cul-de-sac of strategic misfortune or worse. Is it your charge now that Labor are appeasers? I think it's time for... Labor to step up. China's embassy here accused Mr Dutton of fanning conflict and division and distorting China's peaceful intentions as the government released details of the latest visit by a Chinese spy ship.
The vessel detected off Darwin in August moving to Shoalwater Bay Military Training Area in Queensland and Air Force bases on the way to Sydney, then New Zealand. Its primary capabilities, collecting electronic intelligence and tracking ballistics. Not illegal and not that unusual, says Scott Morrison, but... They were keeping a close eye on us and we were keeping a close eye on them. HMAS Supply watching the watchers every move. Mark Riley. 7 News. The Black Friday sales frenzy is sparking a spending spree of $1 million every minute. This year's event is tipped to break retail records, giving a much-needed post-lockdown boost to the economy. A spending frenzy... A group of us come down, we're going to knock off our Christmas shopping all in one day. ..equals a retail revival. In just two hours of opening, so we opened at 8am, we've done a whole day's worth of trade. People are, have got money in their pockets and they are ready to spend. That's for sure, with cashed-up shoppers dropping a million dollars a minute from Black Friday right through to Cyber Monday. It's actually made November the biggest trading month in the year for retailers, surpassing even December. Retailers, the big winners, with Victorians tipped to spend $1.45 billion saved up through lockdown. They're actually really good sales. How have you found it so far? Yeah, it was good in the morning, but getting to later in the day, there's been really long lines. Customers are cashing in on deals like... The uh, BSM1 and the BSM balance, which is a really great deal, um, down 24%. Off. There's a big price drop on supersonic Dyson hairdryers at DJ's. Myra is slashing 50% off homewares and up to 40% off men's and women's clothing. At catch.com, there's $1,000 off LG TVs and 20% off Target toys. And now's the time to bag a bargain flight. Virgin has dropped fares for just $49 from Melbourne to Hobart and $79 to Ballina and the Gold Coast. And there's plenty more. It's a great opportunity for people to come out, be able to spend a little bit on themselves or maybe even get ready for their, uh, their Christmas presents. 300,000 shoppers are expected here at Chadston over the four-day event. And just like most retail outlets, it's extended its trading hours to spread out the crowds. We're expecting this year's Blackfest to be an all-time record. Sonny Marinelli, 7 News. Mm. Australian cricket has officially entered uncharted territory. Jackie Felgate, the new test captain, has outlined a bold vision on his first day in charge. He has, Mitch. Hello. Pat Cummins and Steve Smith are set to lead our test team like never before. Coming up shortly, Ricky Ponting reveals how the new regime can best make its mark. Plus, we speak exclusively to the man most likely to replace Tim Payne. Also, what better way to celebrate draft night than heading straight to your high school graduate? Oh, I love it, Mitch. And a former Blues whipping boy has found a new home in the rookie draft this afternoon. We'll have more on that shortly. OK, thanks very much indeed, Jackie. A bizarre banana sculpture is triggering a backlash. It's designed to slow traffic and has cost taxpayers tens of thousands of dollars. That's coming up next. Also, frightening claims in the English Channel tragedy. How music is set to lure people back to the Docklands on a Friday night. And later, the new drug slashing the most stubborn cholesterol. Vandals have attempted to sever the top of a controversial banana and skull sculpture in Fitzroy. Some ratepayers are furious because the local council used Transport Accident Commission funds to pay for the work. After a year sculpting fallen fruit, for Adam Stone, this vandalism is so demoralising. It is definitely upsetting and disappointing. <laughs> The vandal appeared out of nowhere last night, concealing his identity, his motive unknown. A couple of guys, uh, about 11.30, uh, came in, just hacksaw, trying to chop, chop the head off. Uh, one of my other managers came over and sort of scared them off. You didn't expect someone to uh, try and come down with a saw and cut it in half. The controversial $22,000 work highlighting climate change was funded by the TAC, part of a council project to slow local traffic. We were not specifically aware that there was a piece of uh, art which was uh, going to be a banana. Even in quirky Fitzroy, this banana split local opinion.
brightens up the place, it looks good. I think our money can be spent a lot wiser. What is that supposed to represent? Could you tell me? It looks like a angry banana to me. Another yellow peril. Like the infamous fault of the 1980s, public sculptures don't always appeal. I'd prefer having something that's a little bit controversial and that gets people thinking rather than something that just kind of disappeared into the fabric of the streetscape. Nick McCallum, 7 News. The search for William Tyrrell is being extended despite no breakthrough after two weeks of digging. Today, police sent off fabric and other small items for forensic testing. Every item we take that we deem to be relevant will be forensically examined. We won't be announcing the results of those examinations. That's a matter for the investigative team and the coroner. Seven News can reveal the inquest into the boy's disappearance could reopen uh, and his foster parents recalled with a new line of questioning. The two survivors of the English Channel migrant tragedy claim their dinghy was hit by a container ship. 27 people, including a heavily pregnant woman, were killed in the disaster, which has sparked a new political stoush. Left floating in the icy water, the flimsy inflatable dinghy, discovered by fishermen, surrounded by bodies. Police have been told it was hit by a container ship. Twenty seven people died, seventeen men, seven women, one of them pregnant, two teenage boys and a girl. The body of a man washed up on the French coast today. Police investigating whether he was the one person unaccounted for. Yet more migrants attempted to cross the world's busiest shipping lane. Many are picked up by British patrol boats taken away for asylum claims to be processed. These journeys across the channel are absolutely unnecessary. But I, as also, as I have been warning for two years, they are also lethally dangerous. Britain accuses France of failing to stop the tragedy. Previously, police have simply watched the boats leave. The battle between London and Paris over how to deal with the crisis is complicated by a strained relationship between the two governments. Already at loggerheads over the controversial AUKUS defence pact with Australia, spats over fishing rights and, of course, Brexit. In London, Hugh Whitfell, 7 News. Back home now, live music is returning to Melbourne's streets with a three-day festival kicking off tonight and buskers back in the CBD. Live now to Emma O'Sullivan and Emma, it's the latest bid to draw the crowds back. Mitch, there's nothing like live music to create some atmosphere and a great great place to get some free entertainment this weekend is here in Docklands at the District Dopplick Docklands Shopping Centre. At the moment, Victorian singer-songwriter Abby Stone is on stage. There's going to be some emerging as well as some very well-known Australian acts after Abby Stone tonight. Joe Camilleri and the Black Sorrows will be on stage. Tomorrow night, it will be crowd favourite Daryl Braithwaite who will be here entertaining Diana and shoppers. We know that music not only brings vibrancy to our streets but it is a major attractor of people. As Victorians return to the CBD, they're going to notice more live performances and that is because busking is back. The Melbourne City Council is paying street performers to put on more than 30 shows each week, Thursdays to Sundays, until the end of the year. Great to see and hear Emma O'Sullivan in the city. Thank you. Jane Bunn joins us now. And Jane, how does the weekend look? Oh, Mitch, we have been through a lot in recent weeks in Melbourne and Victoria. La Nina encourages rain. We've already had plenty of it and there will be a lot more to come this summer. But it is not wet all the time and we're about to take a break, starting with pleasant weather this weekend. The day-to-day -day pattern is changing. High pressure is moving in to give us a stretch of dry and warm. Now, I'll show you how long it'll last after Sport, Mitch. That sounds a bit better. Thank you very much, Jane. Forest towns are for schoolies. Next, they can't go to Queensland to let off steam, so the trouble's hitting closer to home. See what's happening. Also, a sad tribute for the little victims of a fire tragedy at Werribee. Details live.
And the three-year-old girl kept from her mum for months because of COVID red tape. Heartbroken members of a community in Melbourne's west are tonight holding a vigil for the four children killed in a devastating house fire. Estelle Greepink is at Wyndham Vale this evening where the vigil will be held. And Estelle, it will be a sombre memorial. Well, Mitch, the vigil will take place in just under an hour here at President's Park in Wyndham Vale. The siblings were 10-year-old Hamid, 6-year-old Essen, 3-year-old Nadia and 1-year-old Elaine. They were killed last Sunday when their Werribee home was engulfed in flames in the middle of the night. 8-year-old Ibrahim was the only sibling to survive the blaze. His dad desperately tried to save the four other children, but fierce flames kept him from being able to enter the bedroom. The tragedy has sent huge ripples through the Werribee and Windenvale community and beyond, and a GoFundMe page for the surviving family members has now raised over almost $400,000. And Mitch, tonight people will gather by candlelight to remember those four young lives. Estelle Greeping, Cat Wyndham Vale, thank you. Next year's state election is set to see some new candidates with the introduction of the Victorians Party. It's fronted by business leaders Bill Lang and Ingrid Maynard, Moreland Council, uh, Councillor Oscar Yildiz and former AFL star Paul Dimitina. We're actively listening to all businesses in Victoria to hopefully be a mouthpiece, be a voice for them in Parliament to hopefully reflect what they want us to deliver. The new contenders have their sights on seats in the upper and lower house in 2022. Police are on high alert across Victoria as thousands of schoolies swarm tourist towns. One Phillip Island cafe has already had thousands of dollars damage from out-of-control teenagers. Dozens of schoolies swarm a foreshore cafe at Phillip Island to drink and dance. Then, just after midnight, they climb onto the roof of this storeroom out the front, their mates cheering them on. They're on a cool room panel, so they only take so much load. Within minutes, the rooftop rave is over when their dance floor collapses. Trapped inside, one kicked the locked door open to escape. All the walls sort of just split open. Makeshift repairs have been done. The damage bill around $5,000. Cost, time, you know, things that, especially with COVID and all that, it's not what we need right now. Schoolies Week only officially begins tomorrow. Locals are bracing for around 5,000 school leavers to inundate Phillip Island. <laughs> The footy oval every year gets trashed, they put a car on, they do doughies, they, they ruin it and it takes a long time to regrow, they ruin buildings, smash glass. With limited travel options, bigger numbers are expected to stay in Victoria. After a hard two years, students are expected to party hard. A lot of beach parties, man, it'll be really, really hectic. When the schoolies do come, they steal our stuff, they break things, they, they destroy the atmosphere within a few seconds, they just they don't respect us. Yesterday, just a few hours after the storeroom collapse, police installed this trailer with surveillance cameras so that as schoolies crowds descend on the foreshore, they can keep watch remotely. Every morning you come thinking, oh, what's the damage going to be? Paul Dowsley, 7 News. A heartbroken mother is pleading to be reunited with her three-year-old daughter who is stuck in New Zealand after the border dramatically shut. They've been separated for five months and are facing a bureaucratic nightmare to bring the little girl home. This is as close as little Aria gets to one of her mum's hugs. I love you. Love you! The three-year-old flew to New Zealand to visit her nan in June. The next day, the borders slammed shut. She hasn't seen her parents for five months. She's now getting extremely distressed, questioning whether or not she can come home or if the planes are working. Auckland is in lockdown and Alia can't afford the crippling costs of flights to New Zealand and two weeks of hotel quarantine there and back in Australia, including four weeks without pay. I've called the local MPs, I've called... Health lines. But it's a logistical minefield. Aria is too young to fly home unaccompanied. Seven News called the Prime Minister's office. They're now trying to help Alia access DFAT hardship funding to fly over and collect her daughter without quarantining in New Zealand. On the facts that you've said, that sounds like a really challenging and difficult case. The other hurdle, flights from Auckland don't arrive in Brisbane until December 13, meaning they'll have to fly to Sydney, then get an exemption to enter Queensland and quarantine 
quarantine at home. Our exemption teams do consider whether there's exceptional circumstances. Queensland Health says it has received Alia's exemption request and is waiting for New Zealand to give the green light. Samantha Heathwood, Seven News. A new treatment is promising big results in slashing bad cholesterol. Details are next on 7 News. Also, the new crime wave sweeping through shopping centres. The staggering cost of each one of these Montague Street Bridge run-ins. And fancy footwork in the zoo's hippo enclosure. The true cost of Victorian truck drivers colliding with South Melbourne's Montague Street Bridge has been revealed. Because every bridge strike that is hit costs the Victorian economy more than $100,000. And the six-figure sum could be more if the crash results in traffic delays lasting longer than 45 minutes. There's a new crime wave in the United States with organised syndicates targeting high-end retailers. Dozens of thieves are swarming stores, smashing and grabbing as they go. A boutique clothing shop in Oakland, California, cleaned out. If only it had this many paying customers. How could you stop the force of 40, 30 to 40 people? That's a football team. Team retail robberies, the criminal wave, sweeping Chicago last week. They took $160,000 worth from this Louis Vuitton store. Then San Francisco. Probably saw 50 to 80 people in like ski masks, crowbars, night, like a bunch of weapons. Some arrested. <laughs> But Californian officials are now under pressure to ramp up penalties. This is looting. This is havoc. Experts say this is organised crime, moving in on what was a playground for petty crooks. These thieves are not stocking their own homes. They're paid for a few wild minutes at work. We've allowed criminal networks to create a business model selling stolen goods online, and that is what's put this problem on steroids. In the United States, Tim Lester, 7 News. There's a promising new drug for Australians with high cholesterol. Researchers have found an experimental medication paired with an existing one can dramatically improve heart health. They're the go-to drug for thousands of Australians with high cholesterol, but statins aren't for everyone. My clinic's full of patients who have trouble tolerating statins. Even when patients can tolerate statins, about half of my patients don't get their cholesterol levels as low as I would like them to be. Monash University researchers have now found a solution, pairing the well-established drugs with an experimental one, and the results are impressive. We're able to show that we could lower the levels of bad cholesterol on top of their statin by about 50%. The new drug called obicetrapib works by stopping good cholesterol from turning bad, reducing the amount of it in the body over time. It turns out cholesterol is a lot like blood pressure. So we're finding that more and more patients with high blood pressure in the community require not just one medication to treat their blood pressure effectively, but are requiring two, three, sometimes four. Cholesterol turns out to be very similar. 1.5 million Australians have high cholesterol. If left unchecked, it can lead to heart attack or stroke. A lot of people cannot even feel that they have high cholesterol. It's a, it's a silent risk factor. Now that the combination has been proven safe, the next step is to trial it in more people. It's hoped that will lead to more treatment options for patients. These new medications which can halve cholesterol levels really have the ability to be a game changer for patients, particularly those who can't tolerate a statin. Estelle Greypink, 7 News. A pygmy hippo at the Melbourne Zoo is showing off his fancy footwork. 14-year-old Felix is being trained to manoeuvre his 260 kilogram body to help vets check his hooved feet, big teeth and squat frame. Felix is part of a breeding program to help his endangered species. 
He's very cute. Very handsome fella. Mm. Sport is next with Jackie Felgate. And, Jackie, Australia's mm. test team has entered a bold new era. Hello, Mitch. Yes, they have. It has. And Pat Cummins is already leading from the front. Coming up next, we'll hear his groundbreaking captaincy vision for the Aussie side. Why Cricket Australia was left with little choice as a replacement for Tim Payne mounts his Ashes case. Plus, how Jeff Kennett welcomed a Hawks draft steal as the Pies swoop to deny the Bombers. Also, one father's emotional plea for the AFL to protect the game's newest crop of young stars. And why this unlucky golfer was controversially denied a $160,000 car. Welcome back. Pat Cummins has laid out his vision for the Australian Test captaincy, detailing how he plans to overcome a 65-year Aussie cricket first. With Steve Smith as his deputy, they've got the approval of Ricky Ponting with a host of questions yet to be answered just 12 days out from the Ashes. A new era in Australian cricket and a groundbreaking partnership. You'll see Steve moving fielders around, um, maybe doing bowling changes, taking a bit more of a... Um, an elevated vice-captaincy role, and, and that's what I really want. The first quick to take on the captaincy full-time for the Australian men's test team and for his deputy, redemption from the ball-tampering scandal. We've known each other a long time. We're, we're close friends. We, we get on really well, and I think we complement each other. I think it was really important that the team actually appointed someone that was going to be able to help him out when he's under the most pressure, which, and you don't get under any more pressure than an Ashes series. Cummins says he's up for the challenge and the squad is feeling confident a tumultuous week. It was only, I think, 10 days ago since we won a World Cup, so uh, the overall mood, um, yeah, I guess, outside of uh, feeling for Tim is, is one of real excitement. And although Smith has his detractors, former captain Ricky Ponting says there wasn't much choice. If you look through the current playing 11 or the 15 that they've got in that squad, it, you know, there's not a lot of other experience around other, other than the other fast bowlers and, and, and Warner, I guess, at the top of the order who, who actually can't do it either. Attention now turns to who replaces Tim Payne with the gloves. Selectors meeting this afternoon with Alex Carey front of mind. Yeah, I'd love for the opportunity to arise. Um, if it does, I'd feel very confident to go out there and, um, yeah, compete against the best in the world. Queensland's Usman Khawaja also diplomatic about his chances against Travis Head for the number five batting spot. Heady deserves it as much as I do. Um, I'm really good mates with them. I've got no issue, whatever happens. Laura Spurway, 7 News. North Melbourne and Hawthorne were among the big winners on night two of the national draft. A host of famous names found new homes while Collingwood swooped to outbid one of its fiercest rivals. Early celebrations at new kangaroo Josh Goder's home were a touch subdued. An hour later, the lifelong North Melbourne fan arrived at his school graduation, a rock star. Bottles were popping for Hawk Sam Butler. <laughs> the brother of St Kilda's Dan, a bargain at pick 23. We're pretty similar in what we do. I probably model my pressure and my tackling off um, his aspect of his game. Even receiving a call from Jeff Kennett. Telling me what he does around the club and all that. So um, I remember the, the Kennett's curse and all that with the Cats when I was younger because I used to go for the Cats. Richmond diehard Tyler Sonzi, one of five new Tiger Cubs. Yeah! Four Sons of Guns selected, Daniel Motlop's son Jesse joining Carlton with his dad not playing 100 games for the Ruse or Power. North Melbourne champion Glenn Archer's son Jackson landing in Arden Street. Power superstar Peter Burgoyne's son Jace following in his footsteps. And Brownlow medalist Shane Lowe Woden's son Taj now a demon. It's obviously a lifelong dream and... Um... Been wanting to do it my whole life. Collingwood moved above Essendon to nab Arlo Draper. Pies recruiters already comparing the on baller to Scott Pendlebury. Mitch Cleary, 7 News. The father of a high profile concussion case has called for the AFL to take a stand with the new draftees. Chief Football Reporter Tom Brown has the story. Tom, you've spoken to the dad of a retired Eagle. This week, Daniel Venables has now engaged a lawyer formally regarding his concussion claim, but it's equally for the family about education and they think a message that all football families need to know. We've spoken this afternoon with Peter Venables, Daniel's dad. The only reason Daniel can potentially prove his concussion took place during his AFL career was because he was cleared of concussion in a test at the Western Jets just before the start of his AFL career. And Peter Venables has encouraged all draft parents this week 
to do exactly the same thing to protect their kids. I can't implore enough for every parent to go out and actually have their son, ensure that their son, for their own safety and well-being, have them scanned before they play any player, to be quite honest, who's playing right now. We're having enough issues as there is trying to work through this, this system of the AFL. Every player should be scanned because they have no evidence. Premiership Eagle Brad Shepherd, the latest player who's considering now retirement due to concussion. And just finally tonight, the rookie draft for a number of players this afternoon offered career lifelines, including Levi Casbolt, who's now gone to the Suns, and also Dumont, who's got a career lifeline at Port Adelaide. Thank you, Tom. Melbourne plans to utilise a key member of Hawthorne's dynasty in its quest to go back to back. Midfielder Jack Viney will continue the D's Premiership celebrations at tomorrow's Zipping Classic at Caulfield. We're pretty close to Jordan Lewis, who's, who's won a few of them before, get an idea of you know what, what's required to, to back it up. It will be champion jockey Glenn Boss's final race meeting before retirement and all of the action from Caulfield is live and free on 7 from midday. And with a $160,000 sports car up for grabs, South African JC Ritchie thought he'd made the show. When you're up for a car, it's very unfair, isn't it? The same thing happened to Melbourne golfer Mark Allen, believe it or not. There you Incredible. go. A little yeah. bit of history. <laughs> Good on you. Thank you, Jackie. Jane is next with the forecast. Jane, when does this warm weather arrive? Well, Mitch, it turns pleasant over the weekend, then it's warm to hot for a few days next week. The full details are next. Hello again. We're on the precipice of a big change in the weather, transitioning from cold and wet to warm and dry. And it all begins this weekend. This morning, the city was hard to see. It was shrouded in fog. The temperature rose to just over 20 at lunchtime, but the sky did remain fairly grey. And the wind is a strong southeasterly, so it's not as pleasant as it sounds. Heavy rain is falling in eastern New South Wales today, with just a bit spilling over into our far east. Otherwise, there's a lingering cloud and in those gusty southeasterly winds, there were areas of drizzle in the south this morning. Those winds are only strong enough to do damage up on the ranges. Now, that will continue into tomorrow morning when the wind finally calms down. After all the rain, the snowy and upper Murray rivers are in minor flood. That's down to about Corowa. A low over New South Wales is bringing rain to a large part of eastern Australia. That low moves offshore tomorrow. We'll have high pressure take over here. Now, we will still have troughs bringing thunderstorms to New South Wales and Queensland, but Victoria should be protected under this high. So this is the last of the rain for a while. Tomorrow there's just lighter, fairly drizzly activity and it is only over Gippsland. The rest of the state begin a dry stretch of weather and it'll gradually warm up. Each day temperatures rise a few degrees. We start seeing warmer yellows and pinks by Monday and it rises to hot reds by midweek. Now if you've been waiting for stable warmer weather. This outlook is just what you're after. Around the nation tomorrow, there is the risk of showers and thunderstorms in Brisbane. Sydney, grey, cool and showery. Canberra, also grey, but mostly dry. In Hobart, it's pleasant. Uh, sunshine under the high. Adelaide begins to warm up and Perth remains hot. To Victoria, Gippsland still grey with lighter, more isolated showers. They'll ease back there during the day as the wind does too. The rest of the state dry. The south has cloud clearing to sunshine while it is sunny for much of the time in the north. Closer in, there is still a bit of cloud lingering tomorrow morning, but as the afternoon progresses, that sunshine should increase. We are all dry, but the wind is breezy. The city is 21 with increasing sunshine. The wind, it's not as gusty as today, so it'll feel a bit nicer. To the eight-day outlook of Sunday, that brings bright sunshine all the way through the day. I'm expecting it to jump up to 23. The winds are lighter. As we go into next week, it's very different to what we've had over the past couple of weeks. It's actually a stretch of dry weather for several days in a row. 27, then 29, only the slight chance of an afternoon shower. Most will stay dry. As we go into Wednesday and Thursday, that's where it gets interesting. It'll turn humid again. We're probably reaching 32, our first 30 of the 
season. I expect it to begin warm on Thursday, then a cool change may arrive during the afternoon on Thursday. But there's nothing overly cold in behind that. So it is at 21 tomorrow, cloud gradually turning to sunshine and we're having a great stretch of weather after that, Mitch. I hate to say, but it'll be great to see the back of this spring. <laughs> Indeed. It has been ordinary. Thank you, Jane. <laughs> and that's the way it is this Friday, the 28th of November. Thanks for your company. For now, from the 7 News team, have a great weekend. Good night.